We've talked about stoichiometry, which tells us the relationship between different parts of the chemical reaction. A chemical reaction is basically an assembly line where atoms get taken apart from each other and put together in different ways that are highly defined. How much we put into the reaction is going to determine how much we're able to get out, just like when we're baking something in the kitchen or making sandwiches. Let's look at the analogy of assembling a sandwich. We need two slices of bread and one slice of cheese to make our grilled cheese sandwich. Let's say we have a bag of bread that contains 28 slices, and we have a pack of cheese that contains 11 slices of cheese. That is our inventory, what we have to work with. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to use all of them. Assuming we want to make as many sandwiches as we can with the materials we have, we end up running out of cheese after making 11 sandwiches. However, there's still plenty of bread after making those 11 sandwiches. We only used 22 of our 28 slices. That means there are still six slices of bread left over. Unless you plan out your reaction perfectly, there's probably going to be some of your starting materials left over in the end. The substance that gets used up first in the reaction is going to be called the limiting reactant. It is going to limit the amount of product that's able to be formed. For example, with our grilled cheese sandwich analogy, the cheese was our limiting reactant. We ran out of cheese and it limited the amount of sandwiches that we were able to make. The other reactants are going to be the excess reactants. There's going to be plenty of them to go with the amount of limiting reactants that we have. Let's look at a reaction. We have H2 plus Cl2 making two HCl. Again, those coefficients of one, one, and two just tell us the ratio of things that are reacting. For each H2 molecule that we put into it, one molecule of Cl2 has to react along with it, and we end up getting two molecules of HCl out. Let's say we put in six molecules of H2 and four molecules of Cl2. That's not actually a one-to-one -one ratio like in our balanced chemical equation. So we're going to end up with one of them being extra and the other one getting used up. Four molecules of H2 and four molecules of Cl2 are able to combine to make eight molecules of HCl. The green chlorines in this picture all get used up. There are still going to be two of the white hydrogen molecules left over, which have not reacted with any chlorines. They don't have any binding partners because the chlorines ran out. It's kind of like if you go ballroom dancing, which my husband and I do. There are often a lot of single ladies and not as many single men at these ballroom dance parties. Everyone pairs up, but there are always some ladies left sitting and watching. The same thing is happening here. There just aren't enough chlorines to go around for the hydrogens to pair up with. The chlorine ends up being the limiting reactant and the hydrogen ends up being the excess reactant. Let's look at another analogy. Let's say we're working in a simple car factory that makes cars out of just two things, a car body and wheels. One car body plus four wheels makes a car. Let's say we take inventory at our factory and find that we have three car bodies and 17 wheels. The question is, how many cars could we make? Well, after we use up our three car bodies, we can't make any more cars but we would only need 12 out of our 17 wheels to make our three cars. There are plenty of wheels, but after three car bodies, then we can't make any more cars. That means the limiting reactant is going to be the car bodies and the excess reactant, the part that's left over, is the wheels. We also know that we could make a total of three cars. To do this kind of simple calculation in your head, you're really doing a stoichiometry problem. What you might be thinking to yourself is that for every car that we make, one car body needs to be put into it. If I have three car bodies and each car body can make one car, then I should be able to get three cars out of it, assuming all the car bodies are able to get used up. Notice when we write the stoichiometric factor, car bodies goes on the bottom to cancel out and cars goes on the top, since we want to find out how much product can be made. Similarly, if I have 17 wheels, and I know that for every four wheels that I have, I can make a car, if I use up all my wheels, I can make 4.25 cars. When we compare the amounts of cars that could be made based on our starting materials, 
that smaller of the two amounts, which is three, tells us that the car bodies are going to be limiting. After we make our three cars, we're going to run out of car bodies. The same is going to be true for chemical reactions. Whichever would give us the least amount of product is going to be the limiting reactant. Also, that smaller of the two amounts, which in this case is three, is the amount that actually gets produced. We are only able to make three cars because after that, there's nothing for the wheels to attach to. Let's bring this back to our H2 and Cl2 problem. We have six moles of H2 added to four moles of Cl2. That's what we're actually putting into our beaker. That's not telling us the ratio of how they're going to react. The ratio of how they're going to react is based on the balanced chemical equation. We have to ask ourselves two questions. If all the hydrogen reacts, how much product could form? And if all of the chlorine reacts, how much product can form? If all the hydrogen reacts, six moles of hydrogen would be reacting. From a balanced equation, we know that two moles of HCl could be produced from each mole of H2 put into the reaction. Moles of H2 goes on the bottom to cancel out, and moles of HCl goes on the top. Then we fill in the coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. Six times two tells us that we could get 12 moles of HCl if all of the hydrogen reacts. Similarly, if all the fluorine reacts, four moles of fluorine would be reacting. For every mole of Cl2 put in, we could get two moles of HCl out. Moles of Cl2 go on the bottom to cancel out, and moles of HCl goes on the top since we're trying to solve for how much HCl could form. We fill those in with our coefficients. We've got a one in our equation next to the Cl2 and a two next to the HCl. We do four times two, and that gives us eight moles of HCl that can form if all of the Cl2 reacts. We compare those two amounts. Since eight is less than 12, that tells us that the chlorine is the limiting reactant since it could produce the least product. And the hydrogen is going to be the excess reactant since it corresponds to the larger of the two amounts. That smaller of the two numbers, eight moles of HCl, also tells us how much product is going to be formed eight moles is actually formed. Once that's made, the reaction stops because there is no more chlorine for the reaction to proceed. We end up with two moles of hydrogen left over with no binding partner. When 21.44 moles of silicon reacts with 17.62 moles of nitrogen, what is the limiting reactant and how many moles of Si3N4 are formed? Three Si plus two and two yields Si3N4? Is the correct answer A, Si is the limiting reactant and 7.147 moles of Si3N4 are formed? B, N2 is the limiting reactant and 8.810 moles of Si3N4 are formed? C, N2 is the limiting reactant and 17.62 moles of Si3N4 are formed? Or D, Si is the limiting reactant, and 14.29 moles of Si3 and 4 are formed. The correct answer is A. Silicon is limiting reactant, and 7.147 moles of Si3 and 4 are formed. We're going to take each of our starting amounts and turn it into moles of product. First, we'll change 21.44 moles of silicon into moles of product using coefficients from the chemical equation. There's a three next to silicon and a one next to Si3N4. We do 21.44 times one divided by three and get 7.147 moles of product able to be formed if all the silicon is able to react. Then we do the same type of calculation with the nitrogen. We convert 7.62 moles of nitrogen into moles of silicon nitride using coefficients. There's a two next to nitrogen and again a one next to silicon nitride. We do 17.62 times one divided by two and get 8.810 moles of product are able to be formed if all the nitrogen is able to react. Then we compare the amounts of product that can form based on the two starting materials. Whichever gives us the least amount of product is the limiting reactant. The limiting reactant ends up being silicon because it gives us the least amount of product. That is 7.147 moles of silicon nitride. That smaller amount is the amount that's able to be formed. 
When there are multiple products, it doesn't matter which one we use for a comparison. We can compare amounts of any of the products as long as we're consistent. We could go from moles of A to moles of C and moles of B to moles of C and compare the amounts of C. Whichever yields the lowest amount of C would be the limiting reactant, and that lower amount of C is the amount of moles of C that is able to form. Alternatively, we could go from moles of A to moles of D, moles of B to moles of D, and compare the amounts of D. But if the question has multiple parts, we might want to use a particular product to save ourselves some work. If one part of the question asks us how many grams of C are formed, or how many moles of C are formed, we should probably use C for our comparison. When we compare the amount that forms, we can pick any of the products. We can also compare either in moles or grams. We could go moles of A to moles of C, then moles of B to moles of C and compare moles of C. Alternatively, we could go moles of A to moles of C to grams of C, then moles of B to moles of C to grams of C and compare grams of C. Why would we want to do an extra step and go to grams? Again, it's going to be based on the question that's being asked in the problem. If there's a second part to the question that asks us how many grams of C are formed, we probably would want to choose grams for our comparison instead of moles. But just for finding out limiting reactant, you can do it either way. Which is the limiting reactant and how much ammonia is formed when 5.65 grams of nitrogen reacts with 1.15 grams of hydrogen. 3H2 plus N2 yields 2NH3. Remember, you can't go from grams to grams directly. You have to go through moles. You're going to have to do it for both of the reactants and find out how much product can form. Is the correct answer A, nitrogen is the limiting reactant and 3.43 grams of ammonia are produced? B, hydrogen is the limiting reactant and 6.48 grams of ammonia are produced? C, hydrogen is the limiting reactant and 13.02 grams of ammonia are produced? Or D, nitrogen is the limiting reactant and 6.87 grams of ammonia are produced? The correct answer is B. Hydrogen is the limiting reactant and 6.48 grams of ammonia are able to be produced. For this problem, we're going to compare the amount of product that's able to be formed, but to do that, we have to get away from grams and get into moles so that we can do a stoichiometric conversion. We have to do it for each of our starting materials. We're going to do grams of nitrogen to moles of nitrogen using the molar mass of nitrogen. Then we do moles of nitrogen to moles of ammonia using stoichiometric coefficients. Then we go from moles of ammonia to grams of ammonia, since it asks us how much ammonia is formed, and all the answers are in grams. We'll compare our amounts in grams, but if you wanted to, you could compare amounts in moles and then later convert to grams. Once we find mass of the product that could form based on the amount of nitrogen put in, we would also do the same thing for the hydrogen. We take grams of hydrogen and convert to moles of hydrogen using the molar mass of hydrogen. Then we go from moles of hydrogen to moles of ammonia using stoichiometry. Lastly, we go from moles of ammonia to grams of ammonia using the molar mass of ammonia. When we compare those amounts of grams of ammonia that can be produced, it turns out that the hydrogen gave us that smaller of the two amounts, and that smaller of the two amounts is 6.48 grams.